on page 18, and it's thank you, God. And I, I, I don't know why, but seriously, that's the song. It's constantly running through my mind, and I just sing it. Out. So I just, I would just like to sing this song if you'll stand with me, and we'll just sing it through three times, and just think, you know. The words are, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. That is something to be so thankful for. And just like China said, there's so many people that that don't know that. But we're blessed to know that. And I just, I, I don't know. I'm seriously, this song, constantly. So that, that must be what we're supposed to sing today. So. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich. The priest was approached one night by Satan himself. Oops, am I on? I didn't turn it on. How about now? There you go. A priest once. A priest. Hello, 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 hello. Yep. A priest was approached one night by Satan himself. Don't be frightened, said Satan. I have an offer to make you. I will make you tremendously powerful, famous, and rich in return for just one small favor. Half of your ability to hear. The priest was stunned. Let me think about that for a few days. The next morning, the priest re requested to meet with the bishop. Your Excellency, I need your advice for a temptation that I have been given. He told me over his strange encounter, the bishop was shocked. A deal with Satan? Do not do it. It will destroy your soul. But he could see the priest was not convinced, so the bishop arranged a meeting with the archbishop. Bishop. Your Excellency, this priest has an argue, er, urgent matter he needs advice about. He told over the story. The archbishop bowed his head in silent prayer and after a few moments responded. Firstly, your hearing is a gift from God. It would be forbidden to sacrifice any part of it. Secondly, a deal with Satan? Never do it. But the priest wasn't convinced. He was imagining all the wealth, fame, and power he'd received. So the archbishop requested the audience with the Pope. The three of them came into the papal office in Great Hall. They sat, and the archbishop spoke. Your holiness, this priest has a terrible temptation and needs advice. And the Pope said, 
Can you say that again? I have one bad ear. <laughs> so that, I, I know I shouldn't have said that. that this is, there, there's a point, there is a point to all of this. Um, one doctor, one lawyer, one priest. A rich man dies and his three sons inherit all that he has. His dying request to the three of them is to show your gratitude for all the money he's leaving them, and he wants each of you to take $10,000 and put it in the coffin. The day of the funeral comes, and each of the sons dutifully puts a paper bag in an old man's casket. They meet up for a drink later. The priest shame, shameless, shamefully confess, I couldn't sleep a wink last night, thinking of all the good our church could do with $10,000. Finally, I decided to just put some watered up newspaper in there. Surely dad would understand. The doctor sighs in relief. I am so glad you said that. I couldn't stop thinking about all the life-saving equipment that our hospital could buy for $10,000. I also put some crumpled up newspaper in a bag. The lawyer wipes his mouth and frowns. I am ashamed of you both. Really, I can't believe you guys. It was dad's last request. So you actually put money in? Of course, my bag contained my personal check for $10,000. <laughs> One more. <laughs> Every morning, the CEO of a major bank in Manhattan went to the corner where a shoeshine man was always there. He used to sit in the chair, read the Wall Street Journal, and the shoeshine man gave his shoes a shiny, great look. One morning, the shoeshine man asked the CEO, what do you think of the stock market situation? The CEO arrogantly asked him, why are you so interested in the subject? The shoeshine man replies, I have $20 million deposited in your bank, and I'm thinking about investing part of the money in the stock market. The CEO of the bank asks, what is your name? He replies, John Smith H. The CEO arrives at the bank and asks the manager of the major accounts department, do we have a customer named John Smith H? The customer service manager of major accounts replies, we certainly do, sir. He is an extremely esteemed customer. He has $20 million in his account. The CEO leaves the bank, approaches the shoeshine man, and says, Mr. Smith, I would like to invite you to be our guest of honor at our board meeting next Monday and tell us your life story. I'm sure we will have a lot to learn from you. At the board meeting, the CEO introduces him to the board members. We all know Mr. Smith, who makes our shoes shine like no one else, but Mr. Smith is also our valued cu customer with $20 million in his account. I invited him to tell us the story of his life. I'm sure we can learn a lot from him. Please, Mr. Smith, tell us your life story. I came to this country 30 years ago as a young immigrant from Eastern Europe, and with an unpronounceable name, I left the ship penniless in my pocket. The first thing I did was change my name to Smith. I was hungry and exhausted. I started to wander and search for a job, but without success. Suddenly, I found a coin on the sidewalk. I bought some apples. I had two options, eat the apples and quench my hunger, or start a business. I sold the apples for 50 cents and bought more apples with the money. When I started accumulating dollars, I managed to buy a set of used brushes and shoe polishes and started cleaning shoes. I didn't spend a dime on fun or clothes. I only bought bread and cheese to survive. I saved penny by penny, and after a while, I bought a new set of brushes and shoe polishes in different shades and colors and increased my clientele. I lived like a monk and saved a penny after penny. After a while, I managed to buy a chair so that my customers could sit comfortably while I cleaned their shoes, which brought me more customers. I didn't spend a dime on the pleasures of life. I kept saving every penny. A few years ago, when the corner shoeshine colleague decided to retire, I had already saved enough money to buy his spot, which was, better place, which was a better place than mine. Finally, three months ago, my brother, who was a drug dealer in Chicago, passed away and left me $20 million. <laughs> so we're going to continue in the book of James talking about money today. Um, so, we are in James chapter 5, 1 through 6. 
James chapter 5, 1 through 6. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth is rotted. And when he says weep and wail, it means in the utmost way. It's like horrible weeping and wailing. It's like you've lost everything and that you're in the worst agonizing pain. That's what he's saying here when he says weep and wail. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted. The moss has eaten, has eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay, the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who are not opposing you. So James is, is not talking lightly about wealth. And I want to go back, like I said last, last week, I said wealth, riches, money, is not a sin to have. It is not. But James is saying, when you turn it into it's because of you that you have your wealth. It's because of you and how you treat people. You have your wealth and you are getting richer and richer on behalf of other people and treating other people horribly. Then it turns into something bad. So this is scripture that I read last week as well. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. Oops. 14, 12, not 12. 14, 12 through 15. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of dawn, you have... You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. And that, that is talking about, it could be Nebuchadnezzar, it could be talking about Satan, but I, he took all, everything that he had, and he himself was going to make himself like a God. He was going to elevate him to the same level as God. And James is continuing talking about wealth. Um, we have jobs. Um, I'm going to say most of us have money in here. We have homes, we have cars, we have, we have everything that we truly need um, to live comfortably. Not just live, but we, I, I think we probably all live pretty comfortably. And God don't have a problem with that either. But 1 Timothy 6.10, it says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So back in the day when James is talking in this verse, he is talking about uh, how people have used their wealth and their, their uh, position in life to continue to gain more wealth and to elevate them to a spot that is even with God, that they don't need a God because they have everything in control. I'm going to read a few stories about some wealthy people and their thought process. Um, it's just a few short stories. We're even doing good on time. Huh? <laughs> so this is an investment banker. I worry about my daughters and their future. I don't spend that much time with them or my wife because I'm working and I love my job and obviously having money. I worry about them resenting me and I worry about my wife having an affair. 
despite the money and the comforts that we're able to have as a family because of my salary. He worries about that. He worries about his children resenting him. He worries about his wife cheating on him. Yet, he continues to work to have the salary, to have the money, to provide everything that he thinks is successful. I, I'm not going to lie. I, I have some of that in me as well. I work hard because I want some things that, that we don't need. And sometimes I put, my, I used to do it all the time. I used to put my work in everything before my family. I worked out of town, didn't think nothing about it because I was getting paid good money. I worked lots of hours and I worked hard and I was getting paid lots of money. And I was like a visiting uncle to my family. I, I missed out a lot of my kids to have that money. And now I look back, how pointless. That money did nothing. The time that I could have spent with the, the son that died in 99. The time that I could have spent with Katie and Megan growing up and, and, and making memories. I was working out of town because I wanted, I thought success and taking care of my family meant providing them with lots of money and lots of things. That's what wealth does to you. I was choosing money over my family. And not only was I choosing it over my family, I quit going to church. God wasn't even a part of my life because I was so much pursuing money and wealth and security. I was putting all of my hope in my own ability. I was putting myself in a position where I didn't need a God. Retired investment banker. I finished working, I've retired, I'm free, and essentially have unlimited funds. So why aren't I happy yet? What do you focus on when you have fixed nearly all of your main needs? People go back to work all the time because they don't know what to do with themselves. Having the purpose a job gives you, getting up in the morning, completing a set of lists and tasks, going home to do it all over again the next day, does something to you. It does something to you. Without purpose, there is no drive, and you end up floating lost. You actually have to concentrate. You actually have to concentrate on your own happiness. In the absence of work, you have to fill that void yourself. I also worry about becoming unrelatable to friends and, and, and other new people. The problems you face when you fix money are so different than when you become unrelatable to the average person. That's what money does to some people. It puts them on a different plateau. And, and he has to invest. He has to, he has to really work hard to make himself feel happy while he is concerned about how people think of him, what they think of him. That's what money does to you. It puts you in a sense of unrest. It can put you in a sense of unrest. This guy, he was okay with being wealthy. And he was okay being on a different plateau. He just had to figure out how to handle it to make himself feel happy about it all. At age 72, he was a multimillionaire. Even so, I still feel some extent that I don't have enough money, he said. Emotionally, I don't come from money. I got very lucky on Wall Street. I've been dealing with a myriad of psychological issues since I retired. I have more money than I ever imagined, but I still worry. Do I have enough? Or if I live longer than I thought? The psychology of wealth is naughty. On the surface, being wealthy can make people believe they have more control over their lives, but it can also control them emotionally. Wealth. I don't know if you think you're wealthy or not, um, but I'm here to tell you you're wealthy. You are always going to be more wealthier than somebody else. So if you think that, oh, poor me, um, there's somebody less than poor you, I'll guarantee it. These are statistics that, that say people that make $10,000 to $100,000 a year is in the top 50% of the world. We're considered wealthy. Most of you are considered wealthy. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that almost all of you, are. we are considered rich. But what do you do with that wealth? What do you do? Are you like the guy that says, man, I just, I just need to, I need another dollar in my 401k. I need another dollar in my savings. 
I need to work harder and, and get more and more and save up so that I'll be comfortable at the end of my life? Are you the, you the person that is constantly taking money and you're spending all of your time and efforts protecting it and, and keeping it there so that you don't lose any of it or get rid of it somewhere? And, um, are you the type of person that, that all you think about is making that next dollar? James says that interferes. It interferes with your relationship with God. And not only does it interfere with the relationship with God, you are hurting others. So these people that he's talking about back in the old times, he says, man, you, you're not paying your workers just so you can have more money. You're not taking care of the needy. You're not taking care of the part just so you can have more money. So it's not about your arrogance, but you are not doing, remember we talked about sins that sins of omission? It's things that God is asking you to do that you're not doing is just as big a sin as doing something that God said you shouldn't do. So James is saying money is getting in the way. It can get in the way. It doesn't have to get in the, in the way, but it, it is the root of all the evil that is about. So when, when they're talking in this scripture and he's talking about mm -hmm. rotting and, and getting moldy and Back in those days, they traded grain. That was their payment. I mean, they could pay for things with grain. They could trade things for grain. Um, and so James says, you know, that's 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 all. That's all good, but it's it, it's gonna it's gonna get rotten. And the clothing they wear, they also used it for trade. So this was money that they. This is how they they traded for goods and services. They would use clothing. And James says, that's all going to, it's going to be all moth rot, all moth eaten. Last but not least, gold and silver. How much have you heard about gold and silver the last several months? Man, our economy is going away. You have to invest in gold and silver. You need to take some of that money that you have saved and invest it in gold and silver because Gold and silver will always, always be here and will always be able to be used for currency. Invest in gold and silver. James says, one, two, that will rust and become so contaminated and worthless. James is saying, do not strive to achieve wealth. Abraham was very wealthy, if you know anything about Abraham. He was beyond belief how wealthy he was. But that wasn't what he was striving for. He was obedient to God all the time, and God just continually blessed him. It had nothing to do about, I'm going to go here and there and make more and more money, and I'm going to increase my herds, and I'm going to increase my slaves, and I'm going to increase my family. <laughs> he was obedient to God, and God blessed him in, in ways that, most of us may never be blessed. So I want to read. This is it's a little bit long, but this is from the Old Testament. And it, it shares with us a little bit about God's feelings and wealth and how it is misused. And this is about a small territory of, of Tyre. And this, this country had, it had a town on shore and it had a town out on an island. And they had, they had uh, places for boats to dock, and it was just an amazing place to always get in and out and, and to trade. And, and Tyre was very wealthy. They had a dye. It was a purple dye that everybody wanted. And if you had something that was dyed purple, it meant you were wealthy. It meant you were really somebody. And, and Tyre, one of the things they produced was purple dye. It took, they said it took 12,000 crayfish of some kind to produce one little drop of this purple dye. And so it, it, it is unbelievably expensive. And if you had purple, something dyed, you were really something. And so people people were constantly trading with Tyre, and then they were coming to Tyre and, and getting their goods, and, and, and Tyre was just getting more and more wealthy. And they became so, so wealthy, and they built up this fortified city out on the island, and oh man, this they were unbelievably wealthy. And so I want to go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel. 
Ezekiel 27. One through twenty-eight fire, and so as as I read this, just think about this city and how how they thought they were really something, and then how they continued to work to be really something. So the word of the Lord came to me, Son of Man, take up a lament concerning Tyre. Say to Tyre, situated on the gateway to the sea, merchants of peoples on many coasts. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. You say, O Tyre, I am perfect in beauty. Your domain was on the high seas. Your builders brought your beauty to perfection. They made all your timbers of pine trees from Sinair. They took a cedar from Lebanon to make the mast for you of oaks from Bashan. They made your oars of cypress wood from the coast of the cypress. They made your deck inlaid with ivory. Fine embroidered linen from Egypt was your sail and served as your banner. And so this is a they're not really talking about a physical boat. They're talking about Tyre, the city. So these people, this is how they gained all their beauty and all their wealth. Um, <coughs> fine embroidered linen from Egypt was your sail and served as your banner. Your awnings were of blue and purple from the coast of Elisha. Men of Sidon and Armed were your oarsmen, your skilled men of Otire, Otire were old, which is old Tyre, were aboard as your seamen, veteran craftsmen of Gibal, were on board as ship, shipwrights to caulk your seams. All the ships of the sea and their sailors came along to trade to your wares. Men of Persia, Lydia, and Put served as soldiers in your army. They hung their shields and helmets on your walls, bringing you splendor. So everybody worshipped Tyre. They wanted to be like Tyre. Men of Arvid and Hillite manned their walls on every side. Men of Gamad were in your towers. They hung their shields around your walls. They brought your beauty to perfection. Tarshish did business with you because of your great wealth of goods. They exchanged silver, iron, and lead for your merchandise. Greece, Tobol, and Meshech traded with you. They exchanged slaves and articles of bronze for your wares. Men of Beth Targamar, Togarma, exchanged workhorses, war horses, and mules for your merchandise. The men of Rhodes traded with you, and many coastlands were your customers. They paid you with ivory tusk and ebony. Aram did business with you because of your many product, products. They exchanged turquoise, purple fabric, embroidered work, fine linen, co linen, coral and rubies for your merchandise. Merchandise. Judah and Israel traded with you. They exchanged wheat from Mineth and confections, honey, oil, and balm for your wares. Damascus, because of your many products and great wealth of goods, did business with you. And wine from Helbon and wool from Zahar. Danites, the Greeks from Uzal, bought their brought their bought your merchandise merchandise they exchanged wrought iron cassian calamus for your wares Dedan traded in saddle blankets with you Arabah and all the princes of Kedar were your customers they did business with you in lambs rams and goats the merchants of Sheba and Rama traded with you for your merchandise they exchanged the finest of all kinds of spices and precious stones and gold Haran Cana and Eden the merchants of Sheba Ashur and Kilmat traded with you in your marketplace. They traded with your beautiful garments, blue fabric, embroidered work, and multicolored rugs and cords twisted and tightly knotted. The ships of Tarshish served as carriers for your wares. You are filled with heavy cargo in the heart of the sea. Your oarsmen take you out to the high seas, but the east winds will break you to pieces in the heart of the sea. Your wealth, your merchandise and wares, your mariners, seamen, and shipwrights, your merchants, and all your soldiers and everyone else on board will sink into the heart of the sea on the day of your shipwreck. The shorelands will quake when your seamen cry out. All who handle the oars will abandon their ships. The mariners and all the seamen will stand on the shore. They will raise their voice and cry bitterly over you. They will sprinkle dust on their heads and roll in ashes. They will shave their heads because of you and put on sackcloth. They will weep over you in anguish of soul and with bitter mourning. As they wail and mourn over you, they will take up a lament concerning you. Who was ever silenced like Tyre, surrounded by the sea? When your merchants went out to the seas, you satisfied many nations. With your great wealth and your wares, you enriched the kings of the earth. Now you are shattered by the sea in the depths of the waters. Your wares and all your company have gone down with you. All who live in the coastlands are appalled at you. Their kings shudder with horror, and their faces are distorted with fear. The merchants among the nations hiss at you. You have come to a horrible end and will be no more. 
The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, say to the ruler of Tyre, this is what the sovereign Lord says. In the pride of your heart, you say, I am a God. I sit on the throne of a God in the heart of the seas. But you are a man and not a God, though you think you are as wise as a God. Are you wiser than Daniel? And no secret is no secret hidden from you? By your wisdom and understanding, have you gained wealth for yourself and amassed gold and silver in your treasury? By your great skill in trading, you have increased your wealth, and because of your wealth, your heart has grown proud. And so it goes on to um, talk about what is in the future for Tyre and its destruction, because Tyre was all about themselves. Um, later on, um, Nebuchadnezzar came, took over the city, destroyed the city on the shoreline, on the shore, tried to destroy the island, but couldn't overcome it because he didn't have any ships to get out to it. Later on, Alexander the Great came. He was going to take over all of the places, and so he thought he was going to overtake the island. He couldn't get out to it. And so what he did was he took thousands and thousands of people, buckets of stones and sand at a time, and built a road out to the, to overtake it. Um, eventually that didn't work either. There was lots of things, but eventually this place was destroyed. Um, and all of its great wealth and all of its beauty and all of its business, business workings and how great it became turned out to be nothing. It turned into nothing. And we heard earlier in James, it says, you know, you're building barns and you're saving money and you're putting back. You fool. You have no idea what will be asked of you tonight. And James is warning us. Allow God to be a part of your wealth. Allow God to be a part of it. And allow God to use your wealth for others. Matthew 6, 19 through 21 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I'm going to end on a, a story that happened to me this week that it's because of the book of James, I'm sure of it, um, had an effect on me. We, me and Linda was going someplace and we was going to donate some money. So we discussed what we wanted to, to donate. And sure enough, we, we actually both had the same amount. That's a, that's a Holy Spirit thing. Huh? And so, yeah, we did that. And so I went to the shower to get get a shower, get cleaned up, and to go to this, and as I'm taking a shower, you know, and um, this little voice in my head said, man, Scott, you're pathetic. <laughs> oh, what? It wasn't an audible voice. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> um, he said, that, that's pretty, it's pretty selfish, that amount you guys agreed on to give. But that, that's what that's what we decided on. I mean, that's what we're going to give. And we're good people because we're giving it all. And he says, yeah, that, that's, that's not very much. He says, what do you, I mean, that's, that's an all right amount. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? What do you think would be a good amount? And it was five times that amount. I thought, you're crazy. <laughs> Do you know how hard I worked for that money? You know I'm saving that money. I have plans for that money. Yeah, you, yeah, that's crazy. This is what we can afford. This is this is what's this is a good amount and it's gonna help people. And the last thing that little voice said to me was, Are you ever gonna fully trust me? I just lowered my head. And I continue why at, at that moment, I, I knew what I had to do. So I went out and talked to my wife. He said, and this is kind of ad lib because I don't remember the conversation, but he said, Linda, I think the Holy Spirit was talking to me about the money we're going to give. And she said, oh, yeah. I 
said, yeah. Holy Spirit wants us to give five times that amount. She goes, can we afford that? And you know why she said, can we afford that? Because that's how I live in my family. That's how we make decisions. Is based on if we can afford it and how much it will it will be a detriment to what we have planned and what we are desiring to do. So I've taught them that. And my response was, I don't think that's the right question. Can we afford that? The right question is, are we going to be obedient? See, because the amount that I was going to give, that was something we can overcome and not be a, you know, it's just a, you know, you forget about it the next week. But five times that amount? And my wife says, if that's what you think God is asking us to do, let's do it. But that's how wealth, that's how money makes me help it it doesn't help me that's how I make my decisions is based on the money that I can afford to do something with Jesus talked about the people who give to the temple they give out of their extra that's how we do it we give something because you know this might hurt for a little bit but yeah we can overcome that but Jesus says you see that little lady right there she only has a little. Do you know what she gave of that little? All of it. So I'm not, I'm not, I learned a very good lesson. And it's because of the word of God. It's because we are reading and going through the word of God and we should always be in the word of God. And the word of God and the Holy Spirit should transform us and we should live our lives a little bit differently. I'm not saying that's always going to happen, but I was I was miserable when when the spirit asked me to give five times that amount. I, my gut was like sick, like because all of my hope, all of my trust was in my own ability. How am I gonna How am I gonna get that back? And he said, "Are you ever gonna fully trust me?" That's all. That's all I had to say. That's all he had to say. Are you ever going to fully trust me? Um, so James is saying wealth is not bad. In fact, wealth is how some people, some of your money is how some people are going to come to know Jesus Christ. But wealth, in my instance, I was making a lot of decisions based on what I had and not on what God asked me to do. And so I'm going to try to do a little better and be obedient and not put my worldly thinking in it. I mean, sometimes God's not asking us to be stupid. God's not asking us to give all of your money to every, every organization, everybody that does good. But God will ask you to help somebody. God will ask you to use some of your wealth to help somebody. And I'm going to try not to be like we always have been. We're going to, we're going to help somebody as much as we can as long as it don't hurt us. I'm going to try to just be obedient and allow the Holy Spirit to let me, let him guide and direct us on what we need to do and, and just be obedient to that. That's what Abraham was. That's what Solomon was. That's what Daniel was. And they were obedient. And you know what? I may never get nothing back for what we gave. You may never get nothing back from what you give. You may never get nothing back for how you serve people, how you love people, until one day. Um, and we're going to learn about that next week. Let's pray. God, we, we live in the United States. We have opportunity to do lots of things. We have opportunity to make lots of money. We have opportunity to start businesses. We have, we have so many opportunities. Just like the song we sang, just like what China was talking about, all those opportunities, we should be giving thanks to you. All the money that we earn, we should be giving thanks to you. 
all the possessions that we have, we should be giving thanks to you. So God, as we go out of here this week, when we make decisions based on money, based on time, based on whatever it may be, I pray that we would stop and listen to your spirit and see what you would have in mind. See what would best serve your creation and your children. And then give us the strength and the boldness and the courage to follow through with that. We know by your word as well that uh, we show our love by our obedience to you. God, I pray that people come to know Jesus Christ this week because of this group of people and because of the decisions they make. So God, help us to not be selfish this week. And I pray all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen.